Ephesians chapter 4, and I just want to make this um, uh, comment really about the future of these online uh, services and when we might be being able to assemble again here in the congregation. And we are tentatively uh, planning, as tentative, hoping to uh, begin assembling a week from today. That would be on the 10th of, of May. And so be praying with us about that. We appreciate those who've been uh, tuning in and participating uh, in these services. And uh, we're going to be uh, praying about and hoping to be able to continue that in the future, even after we begin to have our regular services here. Ephesians chapter 4. I just want to begin by saying uh, something about the, the culture we live in, and the message is not going to be about that, but I will make an application to it. And we live in such a polarized environment. It just seems like, uh, of course, politically, it's always in our view, um, this great divide between uh, partisan politics. We see it in the media. Uh, we see it in many aspects of life. And uh, things that you would think would unite us, uh, sometimes uh, as it plays out, we find that it's not that unifying. Actually, I was thinking today about the attack on our country in September the 11th of 2001, and when we were attacked by terrorists, and there was such a, an immediate sense of unity. People were sort of forgetting what... Uh, divided us and uniting uh, to try to respond to this. And we saw a little bit of this, you know, uh, seven or eight weeks ago, whatever it was, when this uh, pandemic began to spread. But the further we go into it, it's just like the more polarized, again, we become. And I, I want to just look at a passage of Scripture. It has to do primarily with how we relate to one another as Christians. And uh, we're going to be looking at the, some of the, the, the conduct and the character that God expects of us as his children. And we don't have to wonder about that. Thankfully, God didn't leave us to our own imaginations. He gave us his word to instruct us, to teach us, to guide us. And uh, it speaks very clearly about this matter of how we treat each other, how we love each other. Uh, so in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1... Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we're going to look at this passage, and we're going to look at some similar passages, but the emphasis is going to be on the subject of forbearance. At the last part of verse 2, if you'll join me there in looking, it says, forbearing one another in love. So let's just take these three verses and sort of break them down a little bit and then focus in on uh, that subject of forbearance. He says in verse 1, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And so let's just think about the words. Words matter. What does he mean? What does the Bible mean when it talks about our vocation? When you and I think of vocation, we think of a job, we think of our occupation, a career. But here the word vocation is talking about an invitation or a calling. And so he says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, the calling that you're called to. And again, what does he mean when he talks about wherein, wherewith you're called? You know, sometimes we think about the call to the ministry, being like the call to preach. But he's talking about the call of, of salvation, the call of discipleship, the call to be a follower of Christ. So again, he says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. The word walk is a very descriptive word. You know, it makes a distinction between what we say and how we live. Our walk is not just our words. Our walk is our lifestyle. It's where our, our journey takes us, where our walk takes us. It's more than just the way we live at church. It's the way we live our lives. So he says, walk worthy. 
And the word worthy, again, means it's appropriate, it's, it's uh, suitable, it's becoming. He says, I beseech you that you walk worthy in a fitting way, in a becoming way, in an appropriate way of the, the vocation wherewith you are called. So this is really summarizing, in a way, the, the calling of being a Christian. What, what's expected of us? What does God require of us? And I just want to say that it is a privilege to be a child of God. It's a privilege. It's not just a privilege to be a Christian, a child of God, because our citizenship is in heaven, because one of these days we're going we're to be with Him forever, but it's a privilege because of how we get to live our lives below. The Bible doesn't spend a lot of time talking about how we're to live once we get to heaven. That'll all be taken care of by itself. It talks a great deal about how we're to live our life as Christians in this life. We don't live a certain way in order to become a Christian. We live the way God wants us to because we are Christians, if we've been saved, because we're born again. The Christian life has privileges, but the Christian life also has responsibilities. And here we find in Ephesians chapter 4 some of those responsibilities. You can look over to the next chapter And I don't even have to turn the page of my Bible to do that. But in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, let's look at this verse together. Ephesians 5, 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Be followers of God as dear children. The word there that's translated as followers is mimitus. M-I-M-E-T-E-S, mimetus, and it's like a, a mimic or an imitator. Be a follower, be an imitator. Do as Jesus would do, live as Jesus would live. That's walking worthy, as he talks about in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, to walk worthy. And we are to walk worthy. We're to live our lives in a way that is fitting for a child of God to live. Now we can say that in a general sense. By that I mean in all of life, whoever we're dealing with in the community, in our extended family, on the job, we're to walk worthy. You know, Colossians 4 says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Now who are those that are without? It's those that are not in the church or not in the family of God, those who are unsaved, those that are in the community. Walk in wisdom toward them. And it's a, it's, a, it's a high calling. It's a responsibility. Um, I remember hearing this phrase early on in our Christian life, and it's kind of old, but it's still one that we can relate to. You know, the, the phrase is, you may be the only Bible that some people ever read. In other words, they're going to learn about Christianity by looking at your life. They're going to learn about God by the way you live because we're to be imitators of God. We're to be... We're to be an, a reflection of what Christ would be like and do. And so we, we use this language of, of, of um, the, the worthy walk regarding all of our involvements. But in the text, in Ephesians 4, also in Ephesians 5, where we look, looked, it's talking specifically about the way we live with each other as Christians, the way we treat one another. In Ephesians 4 and verse 2, it says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Now that's talking about as God's children. We're to be forbearing toward one another in love. Now, in this uh, short list, really, of some specifics that uh, should, should be examples of how we're to live. Notice what he says in verse 2 of Ephesians 4. With all lowliness. Lowliness would be a word uh, synonymous with humility. Being humble with all lowliness and meekness. Meekness being uh, your emotions under control, not overreacting. And then he also says in verse 2, with long suffering. Long suffering, suffering long, the word we would commonly use would be patience. So that's the way we're to, we're to treat each other with, with lowliness and meekness and long-suffering. 
Uh, we were in Ephesians 5 a moment ago, 5.1, just above that. Let's read Ephesians 4.32. Again, talking about the way we are toward each other as believers, as followers of Christ. Verse 32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Again, Christ is the example. We're to forgive others like he's forgiven us. We're to treat each other uh, with kindness. This is how we're to to live with one, try to treat one another. I think the most, uh, the greatest example of, of humanity loving one another should be found in Bible believing Christians. There's there's more in the New Testament about loving one another than almost any other subject in the Bible. Now, with that being said, let's go back to verse 2 of chapter 4, and let's, let's just kind of zoom in on this and focus on this phrase, the last part of verse 2, forbearing one another in love. Forbearing one another in love. In love, what an important quality uh, for God's people. Well, what does it mean to forbear? It means to bear with. Uh, a way that we might say it in our modern vernacular is we might there's to put up with or to endure. We're to bear with one another. We're to uh, endure one another. I like to look up definitions sometimes in older dictionaries and. Uh, The Webster's 1827 Dictionary defines um, forbearing as this, exercising patience, withholding action, withholding action, or pausing. It's to use restraint. It's to hold yourself back. To forbear means that we're we're holding back. We're restraining ourselves. You know, we don't have to say everything that crosses our mind, everything we think. It's it's forbearing. We're to be forbearing, especially we're to be forbearing, according to the Bible, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Last week, we were studying 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh. And in verse 6 of that chapter... A part of the verse says this, Paul speaking, says, I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. There's things I could say, but he says, I'm going to use restraint. I'm going to forbear. There are things I could say that I'm going to refrain from saying. You know, this matter of forbearance could be very helpful in our relationships. Uh, could be very helpful in our, rela- in our marriages, for instance. Using forbearance. Restraining ourselves. Restraining what we say. You know, my wife and I, believe it or not, my wife and I do not always agree on everything. But we love each other. And nothing will change that. And because we love each other, we realize we're not always going to agree, and we don't always have to have our way individually. And so we, we try to use this quality of forbearance. The same thing in friendships. How many, I wonder how many friendships have been damaged or destroyed because people didn't use forbearance, because they didn't uh, hold back, restrain themselves. Um, we're to be forbearing with one another. And the greatest, according to the Bible, uh, the greatest love and kindness that we should show to one another is, is to, to one another as saints. We're to, we're to show this forbearance to each other. Now, we're in Ephesians, and I'm going to come right back to Ephesians chapter 4. But I'm going to go to the right, just a couple of books to Colossians. And I'd invite you to turn your Bible uh, from Ephesians past Philippians to Colossians And I want you to look with me in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Colossians 3 and 12. The Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Talking about those who are saved. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, 
kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, a similar list that we have over there in Ephesians as we read earlier. Then the first part of verse 13, forbearing one another, bearing with one another, putting up with one another, and forgiving one another in verse 13, if any man have a quarrel against any. Now that pretty well covers it, doesn't it? If any man have a quarrel against any, we're to forgive each other. And then the last part of verse 13, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. We're to forgive others the way Christ has forgiven us. This message is not about forgiveness, it's about forbearance. But I wonder how many people there are who claim to be saved, who claim to be the children of God, who carry ought grudges in their heart against other Christians who, who've, who've broken relationships with other believers, left, left upset or said things and never made it right. We're to, we're to forgive just like Christ has forgiven us. There's something wrong with the Christianity that says, I want God to forgive me, but I won't forgive others. Verse 14 says, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So we're to love one another, we're to forgive one another, and we're to be forbearing with one another. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've certainly noticed it in our lives. Sometimes we have a tendency to be harder on those that we should love the most than we would be toward total strangers. Could be a wife, our husband, our children, our parents... You know, my wife and I were talking about this just uh, this past week and about this subject. As Christians, sometimes we're quick to forgive violent criminals and say, you have our forgiveness, and yet we hold grudges against our brothers and sisters in Christ. Forbearance is a quality that God wants us to have in our life. Now, that doesn't mean that we're... They were soft on sin. It doesn't mean that we're permissive or tolerant as far as rebellion. Sin ought to be confronted and dealt with. Speak the truth, uh, Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, speaking the truth in love. And love is really the source. It's the reservoir from from which we draw our forbearance. I still have my Bible open here in Ephesians 4 and 2. And I'm looking at this passage In uh, verse 2 where it says in the last part of the verse, forbearing one another in love. And that same theme or thought of love is found in the verses we read in Ephesians 5 and 1 and 2. It says, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. We treat each other with kindness. We exercise forbearance because the Bible tells us to. We've been commanded to. But we also do it because we love one another. You know, I want to. I just want us to think about this today, and I've I've been just mulling this over in my mind for some time. But I want to. I want to just apply it to the way we ought to respect one another, and really respect others who may have a different point of view. Uh, you know, we don't. As I said about my wife and I, and this is typical of any marriage. We don't always agree on everything. We don't always see things exactly alike. It's true in churches, in churches, you know, in our church. We don't always agree on everything. Sometimes people may may not really like the song selection. I don't know that for a fact. Maybe they don't like the service schedule. I know we probably have had people, no one's actually verbalized this to me, but we may have people in our church that don't agree with the closures during the coronavirus pandemic. We, you know, why do we have to stop meeting? And, and we try to explain all those things. But you know what? We don't always have to agree on everything. And I'm thinking uh, about some things I've been reading in social media. And by the way, I enjoy many aspects of social media. I enjoy uh, the communication of ideas. I enjoy uh, news resources sometimes who come to... Uh, information can come to us in real time. I enjoy keeping up with friends. 
uh, especially the friends I keep up with that I've never met. We have many friends that we don't know. That's the, that's the nature of social media. But social media can also be so divisive and be so harmful. Uh, it sort of creates a platform or provides a platform uh, for information and opinions to be shared in a way that it's unfiltered. In other words, it just things get thrown out there. I sometimes see something on social media first thing in the morning, maybe something on Twitter, and then you see it just repeated throughout the day. And this, this is not an exaggeration. Sometimes you'll see it repeated throughout the day. People see it, they like it, they share it. And within 24, 48 hours, you find out the whole story has been debunked. It wasn't really true at all. And so because of this uh, means of communication, um, people disagree and become, as I said earlier, very partisan, very polarized. But I just want to say this, and it, and it, it applies to the general topic we're talking about. Because someone disagrees with you, doesn't mean that they're evil, and it may not even mean that they're wrong. You know, it could be that both you and the person you dis disagree with are wrong. And it's just, it's, uh, I just want to say this because I just want to put out a call for our church family and believers in general to use forbearance with one another. Use, use this matter of putting, you know, tolerating each other because we may not always agree with one another. I read, a, I've, I've seen this phrase, and this is something that really came to my mind as I was putting this message together. I've seen this phrase a number of times recently. Uh, during this coronavirus thing that really illustrates it. The phrase is, and I've seen it on t-shirts, I've seen it on signs, and it's primarily by people who are, you know, disagreeing with many of the closures and wanting our country to open back up more, which I certainly support. But the phrase is, my freedom doesn't end where your fears begin. My freedom, the freedom to do as I please, go where I wish, my freedom doesn't end where your fears begin. And, and I'll, I'll be the first to say, I think there have been some restrictions on our, uh, our travel and different things that have, that have been unreasonable. And, and, I, and, I think, and I think also that we need to defend our freedoms, the, the freedoms in our country, the freedom of speech, the freedom to to assemble the freedom, you know, to worship according to the dictates of our heart. But that phrase is the point that I want to emphasize, you know. The implication is that if you support social distancing or if you support health guidelines, it's because of your fear. My freedom doesn't end where your fears begin. But the truth is, some people's have, have, don't, it's not, it's not true that everyone who observes these social distancing things are dominated by fear. Sometimes it's a genuine concern for their health, or maybe it's a concern for other people's health. The point is, though, you know, it, we, we have a tendency to become like it's us and them. If you don't agree with me, you're one of them, and those kinds of things. And we're not always going to agree on everything. Some people may wear a mask. Some people may not. That's okay. You know, by the way, when our church begins to assemble uh, in this auditorium, some people may prefer wearing a mask. And if that's true of you, then feel free to do so. Others may not. That's okay. One person is not more right than the other. One person is not more spiritual than the other. One person may not have more faith than the other. Some may, some may not even feel comfortable assembling at all. They may feel like that because of health concerns, their health concerns, or the health concerns of someone in their family, that they, they, can't do, they can't assemble. That's okay. You know, some may not. We're to demonstrate forbearance with one another. I read something. I talk about some of the negative things on social media, but I read something on social media that uh, it's been passed around this week about from a number of people, and, and I printed it out, and I want to read it to you because it's worth hearing. Maybe you've already heard it. If not, I would encourage you to really listen to this, and it's about all the different governors making different decisions about easing back into uh, some form of um, a new normal. And this is what the article says. 
Some people don't agree with the state opening. That's okay. Be kind. Some people are still planning to stay home. That's okay. Be kind. Some are still scared of getting the virus and a second wave happening. That's okay. Be kind. Some are sighing with relief to go back to work, knowing that they may not lose, they may not lose their business or their homes. That's okay. Be kind. Some are thankful they can finally have a surgery that they've had to put off. That's okay. Be kind. Some will be able to attend interviews after weeks without a job. That's okay. Be kind. Some will continue to wear masks for weeks. That's okay. Be kind. Some people will rush out to get their hair or nails done. That's not okay. No, that's okay. Be kind. The point is, everyone has different viewpoints and feelings. That's okay. Be kind. We each, I'm still reading this article, we each have a different story. If you need to stay home, stay home. But be kind. If you need to go out, just respect others when in public and be kind. Now this passage about exercising forbearance is not about that, but, but, that, but forbearance is what they're ta- calling for. We're to demonstrate forbearance with one another. And I want us to look at one last thing here on this subject of forbearance. And that is this. The greatest example of forbearance is found in God. God is forbearing. In Romans chapter 3, it uses this phrase, through the forbearance of God. What is forbearance? It's putting up with. It's bearing with. God is forbearing. If I could make a very uh, general statement, God puts up with a lot of stuff from all of us. God is very forbearing. In Romans chapter 2, it says this, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness. Talking about God's goodness. Or despisest thou, he says, the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The reality is that God bears with many things in our lives. And the question I would ask is, shouldn't we be thankful for that? Aren't you glad that God is forbearing? And if God is forbearing, then why shouldn't we be forbearing? Now, by the way, because God forbears with something does not mean he agrees with it. I was reading a passage in preparation for this message, a passage in Nehemiah where the Levites, I believe, were sort of recalling how God had dealt with the nation of Israel in the past. And these words are found. Yet many years didst thou forbear them. Talking about God. Yet many years... Didst thou, God, forbear them and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets, yet they would not give ear? You were forbearing with them, God. You you were forbearing toward them, but you sent prophets to tell them the truth, but they wouldn't listen to the men of God. And then this verse concludes, Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. God gave them up, gave them over really to their enemies. So I, I say that because just because God is forbearing with us doesn't mean that God agrees with us. There'll come a time that God will have us to answer for things that that we've done against him. And eventually he will be the judge, but he is, God is forbearing. And I thank God for that. You know, the passage I was reading uh, here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God. We're to be, we're to be like Him. We're to, try to, we're to try to pattern our life after the way God is. It's not just. It's not right. For us not to be forbearing with others, to be unkind toward others, to... to uh, have a bad attitude toward those who disagree with us. <clears throat> it's not good for us. It's not right for us. 
especially when we know how forbearing God is with us. I thank God for his forbearance. And I thank God for his patience with us. Let me be more specific. I thank God for his patience with me. Many, many times over the years, I've had this thought and I've verbalized it to God. God, I just thank you for how patient you are with me. And yet sometimes, even though we know that God shows patience and forbearance to us, we don't show that same forbearance to others. If God is forbearing toward us, shouldn't we be forbearing toward others? Shouldn't we be accepting? Shouldn't we be loving? Shouldn't we be caring? Shouldn't we be forgiving, as we read in our text, toward others? And I just want to challenge us, challenge you, challenge myself, and challenge us from the Scriptures this evening. The Bible says, forbearing one another in love. Because we love each other, because we have the love of God in our hearts, because the God who loves us is forbearing toward us, let's be forbearing toward others and show them the same kindness and love and forgiveness that God has shown to us. We'll bow our heads for just a moment and think about this. Maybe as you've listened to this, you're thinking about some area or some person, some situation where maybe... Um, You haven't shown that kind of forbearance. Maybe someone who doesn't agree with you necessarily. You have not always seen eye to eye on something and and it's caused this ill feeling. Let's, Let's ask God to help us tonight. And I just want to say if you're listening and watching at this time and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you've never been born again, you've you've not personally received Christ. God loves you. And God loves you so much he gave his son to die for you on the cross. He loves you so much that he in his own body, Jesus paid the price for your sin that you could be forgiven. And God wants nothing more than for you to come to him in repentance and faith and receive him as your savior. And I would challenge you to make that a priority in your life. Let's bow together and then I'll close after we had a few moments to meditate on this. Our Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your love and your forgiveness. We thank you for your forbearance with us. Lord, we can see many examples in the Bible of how you bore with your people. And Father, we can look in our own lives and see examples of your forbearance, your patience in our lives. We thank you for that. Thank you for being so patient with us, for working in us and working through us, working for us. And Father, as we pray tonight, we ask you to help us to have the right attitude toward one another. As we love one another, as we forgive each other, as we forbear one another in love, may we, may we, Lord, in our life, in our church life, among our brothers and sisters in Christ, among the community and out in the neighborhood, may we be the kind of examples that, Lord, you'd have us to be. As children of God, Lord, we want to be followers of the Word of God. And we'll thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.